to shake things down and about, and we're going to talk about it this morning. Condition for resurrection. Did you think there was a condition? Now the current condition, this, we're going to go into the current condition of the end time body. Us as well as others. You know, you can't come to life unless you realize you're dead. <laughs> Don't I have an acute grasp of the obvious this morning? All right. Caught up in the spirit. In Ezekiel 37 and 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Oh, my, 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 my. For numerous chapters, Ezekiel had been prophesying by the word of the Lord. When you prophesy by the word of the Lord, one moment you don't know it, the next moment you know that you know that you know. And that, for many years, was the way I prophesied. I had visions, but because I hadn't studied it out in the word, I thought my visions were a hyperactive imagination. So I didn't pay any attention to him. God had to get it to me another way. Note the highlighted words, the hand of the Lord, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. This is a rare experience over the years of God speaking relating to men. You know, there's only one other that had that experience that comes to mind immediately, and that's the Apostle John. I wonder if the two are connected in the spirit. I wonder if studying Ezekiel would help me understand Revelation. Hmm. Just a thought. The way Ezekiel 1 is worded singles it out as an important spiritual experience in the prophet's life and in prophetic communication. One of the reasons prophets aren't being recognized properly and aren't coming to maturity is they don't recognize God's tools for the prophetic. The conditions of the place the Spirit took him are extremely important to understand, both because of their prophetic relationship to natural Israel, and by the way, we're preaching a parallel word. How many know that God preaches parallel words? What applies to natural Israel also applies to the Israel of God. Right. And use it. You're the Israel of God. And we need to hear that. There's so much anti-Semitism and now anti-Christian feeling in the world. That we need to stand for both. We need to stand for Israel. I like what Lindsey Graham said the other day. He said to the current administration, he said, you better treat Israel right or you'll be in trouble. And that's a politician. He wasn't standing for the current cultural movement. In Ezekiel 37 and 2, And caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, the church was very dry. Some of you have come from those churches. Well, we won't go there. All right. In the natural, bones would become this way for a number of reasons. Death and decay. Picked clean by buzzards. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> An extended exposure to the S-U-N or the natural light rather than the spiritual light. Death and decay over extended period of time. Words of spirit and death being spoken into the lives or the local gatherings. Pick clean by buzzard ministry. Matthew 24, 28, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. The word there can be translated vultures be gathered. 
Eagles don't feed on dead things. Let me say that again, you eagles. Eagles don't feed on dead things. Buzzards are those whose ministry are those ministries that only take advantage of people and ministers, and they minister for their own gain. Peter's phraseology was this. They make merchandise of you. They use you for merchandising. They go rich and you go poor. God is ending that in his church today. It's almost time for the tares to be taken out. Or you can call them the terrors, one or the other. <clears throat> in Proverbs 17.2, what are the spiritual reasons for this? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a... Oh, have we learned how to heal broken spirits? Or do we even... You know, I've been counseling for most of my over 50 years of ministry, and I came to a point after I started teaching at the college, and God brought me to some things to write some courses on counseling. I came to this, that we have problems because we don't realize that the source is a spiritual wound. And we counsel them with all the wonderful young and Freud and all that stuff. And we had a few scriptures. But we never look for the spiritual source of the wound. God's calling forth men and women that can heal the spirit. A broken spirit dries up the bones. In Psalm 51, verse 18, the sacrifices of God are broken spirit. In Isaiah 57 and 15, the contrite heart he dwells with. But there's a broken spirit that's negative, and there's a broken spirit that's positive. <laughs> Having our spirit broken causes dryness, the moisture in our bones to dissipate. Those are levels of the wor of words of spirit and life, and they're dried out when we sit under the wrong ministry. Amen. How many have seen, watched the lives of people and they start out in God and they're on fire? You can hardly get close to them without getting warm. And later on, pray that I hold out to the end and pray that the end comes soon. The devil's been bothering me all this week, bless your sweet name. I've heard those testimonies. Growing up in Pentecost, I heard those style of testimonies. They had lost their hope. Their bones, their spiritual structure had been dried out. Now, the wrong types of breaking of our spirit causes dryness. We can be broken by life's experiences or broken by God. The right type of breaking of our spirit causes us to be purified. We can fall upon the rock and be broken. That's voluntary. But I heard another explanation of that scripture that witnessed with my spirit more than the one we were taught growing up. And that is, when I've come to the place that I've fallen on the rock, I can ask the rock to fall on me so that I can become the powder for the incense unto the Lord. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. 
let me be a sacrifice consumed for your praise. Amen. And we used to sing, make me an instrument, didn't we? We don't, but we never put the emphasis on the making and we never understood the making. And so when God began to answer that prayer, we got upset. We rebuked the devil and he didn't go anywhere. Because it wasn't the devil. It was God answering my prayer. Lord, I want to be more like you, but I don't study your life so I know what the process is. Ezekiel 37, 3 to 6. God's question and Ezekiel's answer. And he said unto me, Son of man, can this church, I mean these bones live? And he answered the only way you should answer any question that God asks, O oh God, thou knowest. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye old, old dry bones, or ye dry bones, hear. Wait a minute. Can a dead thing hear? It can if the prophetic word says to hear. We're going to have a, I don't very often do activations, but I've got one at the end of this. The Lord made me sit down and do it this morning. So we're going to do it as a congregation. Okay. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. No doubt about it. And I will lay sinew upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know. You know, there's some things God's going to do just so we know that he's the Lord. He's reserved some things for himself. He's given us a lot, but he's reserved some things for himself so that we will know that it's him. God's question was, son of man, can these bones live? The answer, God, that's, that's up to you, and you know. Then God showed him the power of the tongue, speaking the word of the Lord prophetically. The command, prophesy unto these bones, start with bones here. Church, here. We speak it in a creative word into the church in Jacksonville. Not just this one, but to the church of God in Jacksonville. Hear the word of the Lord. The prophetic command gave dry, intimate objects, the bones, the ability to hear. Uh, getting excited here. Might even get Pentecostal. Oh my. Now, here's the question. Is this the illustration of the words of Jesus? John 5 and 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. We have come into a prophetic time in the church. But prophecy isn't just nice words, not even just encouraging words. It's creative word. Remember, everything you see out there was created by a word. First thing God did was speak. And things happen. When God speaks, things happen. How can I tell whether the prophetic word is right or not? Did anything happen? The last test, when I wrote on the voice of God, the last test of a prophet is, does his word come to pass? Sometimes that takes time. But it's the final test. Is that what happened at his resurrection? 
In Matthew 27, 5, or 52 and 53, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many and were recognized. I don't think they were looking at a picture. Is that you, Abraham? Something in here gave recognition. Hello? Hello? The power of the tongue and the response of God. Ezekiel 37, 5 and 6, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinew upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. God is speaking words of spirit and life. That's the ministry of the church. We've spoke too much judgment, and guess what? People have died, and we're wondering why they aren't coming. Here's what God said to me one day, many years ago. He said, Bill, didn't I say if I be lifted up, I will? He said, why aren't people being drawn? In the light of that scriptures, because I'm not, I don't yet know how to lift him up. Jesus in me should draw people to me. Let me say that again. Jesus in me should draw people to me. Jesus said, Father, all the ones you've given to me have come to me. You mean, Jesus, you didn't go out and get them? Oh, we better not go there. <clears throat> I will cause breath to enter into you. Is this like the spirit that entered into Ezekiel? And took him up and carried him in the spirit to Jerusalem. Carried him in the spirit here and there. By the way, this is Old Testament. Philip was not something new. That was done in the Old Testament. And we, we're coming into the time of greater... Uh, greater work. <laughs> Just want to stir you up a bit. I've got an anointed spoon I'm working with here. All right. I will lay sinew upon you or muscle. I will restore or recreate. I want to say to the ones you're working with, God is either going to restore, which is always better than what you came from, or he's going to recreate. It is not. Listen. When God forgives, he forgets. So if you are forgiven, you have no wicked past. Oh, I wish we could hear that. I, you cannot hold my past against me. You cannot hold my mistakes against me. Why? Because Jesus doesn't. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my. I will put covering or put flesh upon you. I will put breath in you. You shall live or the spirit will, will return into you that you've been without during your dry years. You know, I've watched. We came up here shortly after you guys started here. I've watched some life come into this place. Come on. Thank God. <laughs> The power of the prophetic voice. So Ezekiel 37, 7 and 8. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied. Oh boy. It got noisy. And the bones rattled. By the way, it's them old dry bones. And behold, oh Lord, we want life to come. Behold a shaking. And when God begins to allow things to shake, we get upset. But it might be, it just might be that the Spirit of God is 
speaking and shaking is coming because he's pulling things together. God's getting ready to shake the church worldwide. But it's not going to shake apart. He said, press down, shaken together. Shaken together. Shaken together. Then it can run over. And when that happened, bones came together. Bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinew and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but they're not breathing yet. The stage is just being set. Sometimes to reignite something, God has to set the stage. Sometimes to bring you into an apostolic teaching center, God has to set the stage. He has to send in some gray heads. Eventually, it'll probably be a white head, but right now, it's a not, at least it's not a black head. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. God put a creative prophetic word in Ezekiel's mouth. This level of the prophetic is returning to the body of Christ in the last day. It will be needed as part of the spiritual weaponry against death. This prophetic word did everything but put breath in the reconstituted bodies. The word brought bone to his bone. The prophetic creative word created noise, dust. Oh, you mean there was more manifestation of flesh. When God is bringing something together that's been dry for a while, you're going to see a lot of flesh. Don't get upset. It's a good sign, though not appreciated. And a great shaking. But remember, this shaking is shaking together. I've watched some women make cakes. I used to make them too. And you take this flour and you shake the, the measuring couple to make sure you've got the right measurement. God's making sure he's got the right measurement. <laughs> I'm having fun. All right. Bones were restored that may have been partially there. And if we had buzzards, they may have been broken. And matched with the other bones from the body they came from. I have this prophetic suspicion. You know what that is? I'm not sure it's a prophetic word, but it's a prophetic suspicion. That some bones to one part of the body were over there, and some were way over there. And part of the dust was bone flying to his bone. Oh my, oh my. The sinew and muscle were restored to the bones, but the bones had to come together first. We are in the bone stage. You know, if God poured out his spirit like we want him to right now, we'd waste it. Oh, hallelujah. Feel good. No substance would come from it. I've been around Pentecost 63 years. No, longer than that. I've been saved 63 years. And I've seen a lot in those years. And we have wasted the anointing. No more. No more. God is returning a seriousness to the church, 
a soberness to the church, but not a long-facedness to the church. We have a picture that I love hanging in our home. It's the laughing Jesus. I think he had to have, he loved having fun. It said he went through everything we did. Hello? We've made him so religious it's sickening. He's sick of it. All right. Then, the need for a second speaking reminds me of Jesus praying twice for the blind man in Mark 23. I forgot the, the chapter there. The verses are 23, 25. All right. What will bone to his bone look like? I believe the bones were scattered over the whole valley. Not all the bones were of one body were together. This is the condition of the end time body of Christ. They're in a state of death and dryness even though they are saved. They were God's people. My, I better get quiet all of a sudden. If we don't realize what state it's in, we can't pray it out of it. God is gathering men and women to, represented by each bone to those who have the same DNA of vision and purpose in order that his end time work might be done. This excites me in case you can't tell. There will be apostolic centers, prophetic centers, teaching centers, and evangelistic centers where God's emphasis, where God emphasizes and trains those type of ministries for his body. There, he is gathering this together. These spiritual lymph nodes in the natural body, the five white corpuscles, go from the lymph nodes throughout the body. And those five white corpuscles are analogous to the fivefold ministry. But we need to know what our calling is, what we're released to, where God's. Listen, uh, I remember about three years ago in March, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I'm getting ready to release the fivefold ministry to the whole body. I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, there are certain. We have apostolic ministry, we have prophetic ministry, but they're only located in particular areas. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, remember the ear when I studied the ear? Yeah. He said, there are five nerve endings in the ear, right? Yeah. Three major, two minor. Isn't that interesting? He said, but they never leave the ear. They govern the hearing but they don't go beyond that. He said, but the five white corpuscles go throughout the whole body. He said, I'm getting ready to send forth fivefold ministry that gather. I got excited about that because I've been asking him that question for a long time. These spiritual lymph nodes will produce spiritual antibodies in the body of Christ. Christ's DNA is the antibody to the Antichrist work that he's trying to work in the body of Christ. I need his DNA. It's the only thing that will protect me from what's coming. God will bring people from around the world who belong in our section of the body and purpose of God for his end time work together. Amen. How many know who Kim Clement was? Where did he come from? Where did Rodney Howard Brown come from? God brought them to America because they belonged in the DNA of God's purpose for America. And if he brings me here, you're in trouble. Because that means I belong here. And that means 
I got DNA that you need. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. Only when he has bone to his bone will he bring substance upon the bones. This is not an instant work, but a work of restoration and process. Ezekiel 37, 9 to 10, And then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O, bre o breath, and breathe upon these dead ones, slain. Would that give us a different sight on precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints? Because he's getting us ready for resurrection. I know this is going to be an acute grasp of the obvious, but there can never be a resurrection without a death. Let me just say this. I'm in over my head already, so I might as well. We have heard in all the charismatic circles, all, all stripes, you've got to die to self. <laughs> and it worked. We're all dead. <laughs> but they never taught that God is a God of balance. And if I die daily, I must rise to walk in newness of life daily. So I believe there's coming a resurrection such as this church has never seen. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet. Deborah, what's that say? An exceeding great army. <laughs> oh, you mean resurrection brings me into warfare. We have gone... The Lord spoke to me one day and he said, Bill, I want you to start in Genesis and I want you to write your way through the whole Bible looking at the wars that I ordered and I will show you spiritual strategy. That's called the key of knowledge and I'm still learning because I got all the way when I, I did the... Number five is the Gospels. And I thought, this should be a breeze. I can probably do from Matthew right on through to Revelation. No. Because here's what the Lord said about the Gospels. It's the commander-in-chief coming down to train the troops. That's right. Oh, wow. So I'm still working. I, I, I did, when I did the, the, the Gospels, I came to this conclusion. It's not a course, it's a commentary. 400 and some pages. Then you go back and make the outline after. Because when I write, it's an adventure. I have no idea where I'm going. I just follow the key through the scriptures that God gives me. So it's an adventure. Sometimes I get so excited I don't know what I'm doing. You think that's what's happening this morning. I know. <laughs> he prophesied to the four winds. Each of them had a part to play in the bringing of breath into the recreation. Does this speak of the need for each member of what God is restoring to experience each of what the four winds are symbolic of in the dealings of God? Four winds converging would produce what? What was Elijah caught up in? Oh, you mean when this begins to happen, we're going to be caught into another dimension. <laughs> Where we've never been before. Where the church has never been before. Are you hearing me? I hope this gets in there and troubles you. Just 
get you so hungry you can't stop going to the Spirit of God and getting into the Word. Because that's what this should do. should awaken hunger in you. A whirlwind in the Spirit has significance. Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind in 2 Kings 2 and 11. Not in the chariot of fire which most of your artists depict. The chariot of fire was a divine distraction. A chariot of fire came and a whirlwind. Which is more spectacular? Chariot of fire, isn't it? Oh, you mean it's something like what Elijah was trying to do with Elisha all the way along. Stay here. Now this is the man of God speaking whose words never gone to the ground, who never had a false prophecy. He's saying to his servant, Elisha's not even a prophet. He's a servant. You stay here. Up until that time, Elisha had only heard one word. Follow him to the end. He said no. And when, when the prophets said to him, well, don't you know? Now, all the prophets knew. Every one of those four places, 150 prophets per, per place, knew that Elijah was going up. And not one of them tried to follow. 600 prophets knowing what God was going to do and not interested in being involved. But the servant, the one who was known for pouring water on the hands of Elijah, he said, I've heard something. And I know that if I follow it through to the end, I'm going to get more than I can ever expect. <laughs> the east wind was used to illustrate hard times and difficult circumstances. These were usually allowed by God because of his dealings with a person or a people. The west wind, and there's very little given on concerning the west wind in scripture. The direction of the west is the direction of the journey through the tabernacle in the wilderness to the holiest of all. Now, based on the sparse information we have, I believe that the West is the direction from which one of God's winds of deliverance can come. The, the South winds, using the principles principle of only looking up the word used, we find that south wind only speaks of blessing. Most folks, you know, we're in the south here. I have lived in the north when it got 64 below. I'm glad I'm in the land of blessing. <laughs> yeah, amen. But the most, the most important reference, because of what it refers to, is found in Job 37 and 9. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind. Immediately my mind goes to the historical account of how Elijah was taken up into heaven in the whirlwind. Spiritually, this could signify that when God wants to catch us into another dimension, he sends the whirlwind of his blessing from the south. The whirlwind is a blessing. Even when it seems like everything is going in circles, it's a blessing. God's getting you ready to catch you up into a new dimension. Don't get so excited. The north wind. I've left the north until the last because there is indication of it being the direction of the throne of God. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north? The congregation of the Lord is on the sides of the north as well. Song of Solomon Chapter 4, verse 16 says, Come thou north wind, then blow thou south. The north wind seals in the flavor of the matured fruit and vegetables, and the south wind gives you time to harvest. 
<laughs> Here's some conclusions. By the way, you like that graphic up there in the corner? Yeah. <laughs> the converging of the four winds produced a whirlwind. After the four winds blew on the bodies, the breath of God entered into them, and they became a great army. Amen. After they'd been through the four winds. An army for the days of war and end time battles. Ezekiel 37 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding, an exceeding, an exceeding great army. Last night, as I was trying to go to sleep, the Lord dropped this next thought in my spirit. Does this indicate it will be a people raised into a time of warfare? I just get resurrected and it's time to go to war? Just have the greatest experience that lines me up with the master. And I become a child, children of the resurrection. And it's time to go to war. Could this be the beginning of Joel's army in Joel 2, 1 through 11? I don't know in the scriptures that we haven't found yet. Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, O... Who? Oh, okay. I will open your graves. And cause you to come out of your graves. Wait a minute. He's prophesying to dead people saying, get up. Wake up time. In the end time, there's coming a wake up call. And those that hear his voice shall arise. Yes. Hallelujah. It's not going to be a maybe. There are going to be a people that arise. Oh, my people, and and uh, you shall know that I am the Lord. Oh, let me go back and start again. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. They may try, but they ain't going to bring down Israel. Amen. Whether it's from within or without. God has prophesied a resurrection and a bringing into the land. But we need to interpret that spiritually as well for the church. He, they aren't going to take down the church. They've been trying for 2,000 years. And the more they persecute it, the bigger it gets. Maybe that's why the church in America is not as big as it ought to be. Hmm. And you shall know that I, the Lord, I am the Lord when I've opened your graves. Some people are not going to be convinced until this takes place. They love God. They want to walk with God. But they're dead. And until they see some resurrection, they're not going to be convinced. He said so. So he's got to do it. Because he wants to convince people that he's alive. And I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Note that the people spoken of are... But wait, didn't we, Thursday night, didn't we come across that same phraseology? Come out of her. Oh. Is it possible that they're related? Is it possible that that speaking is when God brings them out of the dead places, out of the graves that hold them captive, and the Spirit of God and the breath of God begins to move in a dimension such as we've never seen? 
Israel's hope for restoration has always been in resurrection. How do I know? Because it says that Abraham believed that if he had to kill Isaac, God could raise him from the dead. There'd never been anybody raised from the dead. How did he know? He saw down through time. Remember that Abraham's vision was a city whose builder and maker was God. He saw all the way down to the end of the book of Revelation. Now that's vision. Israel, Israel's hope is also in the I will of God. And your hope is in the I will of God. Not in anything we do. It's all by grace. Please hear that. God needs to kill the works-based stuff. And if I work, if I do a work, it comes out of grace. The Israel of God's hope is in both of those two things as well. The resurrection, because he's called us to be children of the resurrection, and God says, I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. So here are some conclusions. That does mean I'm winding down. All right. This message of God for the Israels of God was important enough in God's economy to emphasize it with an experiencing of God. There are some things that only experiencing God are going to convince people. Although there could be extensive teaching in this, several important factors stand out. A, the power of the tongue and its yieldedness to speak the word of the Lord takes one into the creative dimensions. You know, one day I was, I get upset about these guys arguing about creation. And I said, God, why can't they ever be convinced? He said, because they're not going to be convinced until a people rise up and manifest the Creator. That settled it for me. God, I want to press into that realm and be one of those used to convince people that creation is real. God is emphasizing what He will do on both the natural level and the spiritual level. See that God is speaking about the resurrection of individuals, a nation, and the corporate body is paramount to recognize. Not just one level. We've kept things on one level too long. And folks, let's be real, it hadn't worked. God's into a bigger plan than we have. God placing His Spirit in my people and through prophetic utterance writing on their heart, they come to a changed way of life. God is going to prove who He is to both realms by setting a people in their God-given inheritance in spite of all opposition. So this is our first prayer. I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to stand and pray together. Okay? Heavenly Father, these are things, these things are beyond our ability to comprehend with our minds. Some of this we have to comprehend with our spirit. Would you put the spirit of them within us so that our expectations are raised to believe you for them? So work in us the faith of the Son of God that we live with those expect, these, these expectations in our lives, knowing you will do what we cannot and accomplish in us what only our yielding will give permission for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awaken about 4.30 this morning. And by the way, the older I get, the less I like to rise early. <laughs> I like to enter into that rest, you know. But here's what the Lord spoke. He said, I want you to take them and stand and pray through Isaiah 43, 4 through 7. Now this is for Christ the Messiah Church. We are 
releasing some things in the realm of the spirit that are going to bring people here. That's the heart of God. I may be one of the first two notes. Anyway, Isaiah 43, 4 through 7. Let's stand. First of all, every one of you need to realize the first part of this because it gives us the authority to pray the rest of it. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee. That's how much God loves you. And people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed. Catch these underlined portions. I'll bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give Canada, up. give up. Oh, yeah. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons. You've got some sons out there that God's going to bring home. And my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that's called by my name to be in this house. God has a people called to be in this house. Hallelujah. And he's getting ready to bring them home. Okay. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Amen. All right, now, Lord, this we're praying together. Lord, we refuse to be controlled by fear. You have seed for this church from the east. Bring it, we pray. There are people you want to gather here from the west. We ask that you prepare us and bring them. North, loose your hold and give up those you are preventing from coming to Christ the Messiah Church in Jacksonville, Florida. We say to the South, you cannot keep those who you are holding captive that belong in this assembly. We have sons and daughters in the nations. Lord, bring them to us. Help us steward them well so that your full plan and purpose can be accomplished and the reason you raised up this church and be totally fulfilled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Ed.